Welcome to your Dollar University, everyone. My name is Emil Kalinowski. I'm joined by Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. Jeff, off the air, we were talking about the article we're going to be discussing today, which is called Tick Consistent, Coherent, Corroborated Inflation Never Had a Chance. That was posted on the 17th of November at the Alhambra Investments blog. And we were talking about how you read it, reread it this morning and you felt the punchline, the abstract, the message, the, it wasn't there. So tell us. What are we trying to convey to the audience today? Well, with a lot of these things, you know, it's, it's very complicated materials, very dense material, very esoteric material. So it, it already involves sort of a long, lengthy discussion. And sometimes people just want you to just cut to the chase, right? Just get to the conclusion and tell me what I want to know. And in this case, we could just, you know, we could write a one paragraph sentence that said, hey, dollar shortage this year, deflationary potential. But, you know... Our goal and in, in my goal in writing these articles, our goal doing the show is to essentially have people work through these issues themselves, to think about it, to do the thought experiments in their head, to really consider how things work and why people are doing certain things. And so we kind of want to go through these, you know, long involved and maybe we could cut a little bit you know, down on the size and make maybe a little more brevity in doing it. But you know, the, the goal here is to get people to work through these things in the same way that we're thinking through them as well. And so we're kind of guiding you on a tour through the euro dollar system. But sometimes when you do that, with even with that, that, that those good intentions in mind, you, maybe you, you leave a little bit too much off of the table. Maybe you didn't, you didn't specify enough. And maybe as I was feeling this morning running through this article, maybe some of it was left, I left it too cryptic and, and too esoteric and maybe maybe deserve a little bit more of a straightforward explanation rather than leaving it up to the reader to fill in all the blanks. And the punchline is that through September 2021, the Treasury International Capital Report is suggesting a deflationary context, not a inflationary one. And we're going to Talk about that. Yeah, no, no I just, I mean, it not just not just suggesting, I think the point here is it's strongly suggesting. In fact, it's unusually strongly suggesting it's every single piece lines up almost exactly. And as I said before in a previous article about tick, you know, what usually happens in these during these periods is that, you know, things line up in general terms, but there's always a couple pieces that are just awry there. You know, it, it's a very complicated world. It's a very messy situation. So sometimes it's not exactly the same, but you can you can still tease out the general message. Where in 2021, it's like everything is lined up almost perfectly that says there's really no ambiguity here. And that that's I think it's a it's not just that, hey, there might be a, a, a deflationary dollar problem here. It's there is one. We just don't know how big it is. It's fascinating because the audience, the tens of viewers that we have are nodding their head and wondering the same thing I am. It's incredible how in the mainstream financial press, it's the exact opposite message. It's unambiguously inflationary recovery, reflation, takeoff, boom, is right around the corner. Well, at least that's my sense of it, Jeff. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Has the tone turned a little bit more negative recently? Is that I'm perceiving that or am I wrong? I think there's, you know, that's where you hear the term stagflation being thrown around. Everybody's still convinced inflation is going to be big because why not? The CPI is now the highest it's been in 30 years. So obviously there's inflation, at least according to the mainstream narrative, but yet the economy seems to be tailing off a bit, if not a little more than a little bit. So everybody's, okay, this must be what stagflation means. And it's, this is why we were very adamant, at least I am very adamant in, in, in saying is this inflation or is it not inflation? Because if it's inflation, you're not going to see the econ the nominal economy. Certainly, that's not going to be tailing off. It's going to be continuing to accelerate. So if it's not inflation, if there's not money behind it, then something else is going on. The CPIs are high for other reasons that, as we've discussed in the past, these various episodes in the past where the CPI can go up over short run periods for reasons that have nothing to do with money or the economy. One of my uh, other jobs is to be Alistair Cook, the British narrator, introducer to macro piece theater. And I do, no, he did masterpiece theater and I do macro piece theater. And next week, I'm going to read a report by the Bank for International Settlements, just a really short one where they go into what is probably behind these consumer price increases. And they go into the supply chains, as we've been talking about, as well as the good surge. It's a good article, good little report, uh, lots of graphs, good stuff. So I guess we've talked about that before. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, you can look forward to that next week. This week, right now, 
We're going to talk about the Treasury International Capital Report. The September data is out. Jeff, as you tell us in this article, wow, this has been around for 80 years, this report, some form of it, incredible, well before the euro dollar system was even created, incredible. And so, you know, there's, you've got to respect the report that's been around that long time. And as you tell us, you respect this report for being pretty good in giving you a view into what's happening in the shadows. But it was never designed and never updated for the euro dollar system as it should have been. And one of the big things that are missing, you tell us right up front, is securities transformations, repo. One kind of repo is in there, but you would love to know about another kind of repo. Which kind of repo is in there and which is missing? Yeah, we're going to go down the rabbit hole with all this stuff because not only do you have uh, you know complicated real world processes, but you also have this layer of technical jargon that makes it often confusing with, with, with what you're talking about. But starting specifically with PIC, you're right, Emil. It goes back to 1934, which is admirable because you know, 1934 is a specific year at the bottom of the, the, the collapse of the Great Depression. You know, people in the Treasury Department said, maybe we need to take a look at what banks are doing out inside and as well as outside the United States and how capital is flowing around the world, because that seems to be pretty important. But the problem with having a series that goes back to 1934 is that deeply embedded within it are its own 1934 style of biases. It's basically starting out in 1934 and you can update it now and again. But, and, you know, as things change over time, especially the you know, massive euro dollar re evolution that took place in the 50s and 60s, maybe you're using an outdated worldview as well as an outdated series and an outdated format. And one of the biggest contributions or the biggest parts of this euro dollar ascendancy was repo and collateralized lending and all sorts of things like that. And what the uh, even to this day, despite the fact that tick data has been updated several times and in several significant fashion, what they if you read through the instructions, which I'm pretty sure everybody has, because <laughs> why wouldn't you? It says do not if to the, to the instructions to the banks that are reporting on these forms, you do not uh, report any resale or any repurchase agreement where the opposite side of the transaction doesn't have cash coming back. So in other words, if you're engaged in a security to, for, to security financing transaction, which collateral transformation, like if if you're trading a you're lending out a treasury security and getting back, say, some form of junk euro bond as collateral for your collateral, that doesn't get reported on tick because the tick data, the tick series isn't really interested in the securities. They're more interested in the cash. So basically, the instructions to the banks are. You're only reporting things that have a cash component to it, which, you know, again, as you referred to, as you said, Emil, our audience is, is already well aware that's missing maybe the most important parts of how the modern system gets done. So in some ways we love tick, but in other ways it, we just we just have to, you know, this is the best best we can do. So now we get into what's going, you know, what's going on specifically recently or even just the last 14, 15 years, what what's happening with resales and repurchases. And that, that brings in another problem too, because now we have to classify what everybody's doing. What is a repurchase? What is a resale versus what is a reverse repo? Because that's one of the things I left out of this tick article when I presented the chart that showed foreign uh, foreign official institutions that were engaging in these uh, collateralized repurchased agreements. What that really was, and I think some people might, might be able to recognize the pattern there, that's really the foreign repo pool that we've talked about before, but I think it's been a while since we've talked about foreign repo pool, which is essentially an accommodation the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has given to foreign FOIs, which are foreign official institutions, central banks and governments. And what they're doing is essentially as a correspondent node in the global payments network, it's an accommodation. So you think, okay, this is an accommodation for foreign official institutions, but why are they using these things only during specific periods of time? Why does the balance in, these, in this foreign repo pool that tick captures, uh, why does it only go up during specific time periods? And again, from the Federal Reserve's perspective, this is called a reverse repo because the Fed always characterizes these transactions from the perspective of its counterparty. So let's break down what's going on here in the foreign repo pool and what it is that TIC is showing in parallel to the foreign repo pool, which is essentially from the Federal Reserve's counterparty's perspective, a reverse repo or a resale. 
So these foreign official institutions are essentially lending cash to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York in exchange for U.S. Treasury collateral. So putting this in terms of what we were talking about before, it's the foreign official institution is actually borrowing treasuries from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York by putting up cash as collateral. That's why it gets captured on t by tick because there's a cash co uh, there's a, com a cash component to it that sh that gets reported on all of these various tick forms. And the, really, the common explanation for the foreign repo pool, which is you know which is given from that 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 guy at Credit Suisse that everybody always turns to as the uh, the expert or the guru, he basically says that well it must be the foreign the the uh, Federal Reserve is paying a higher a higher repo rate to the for this accommodation. Then otherwise that these uh, these foreign official institutions could get in the marketplace, and that kind of gets re for that, that's that's the uh, mainstream narrative for the foreign repo pool because what else could it possibly be? But when you start thinking about these things in terms of foreign official institutions are borrowing treasuries collateralized by cash, that opens up the door to so, so many different possibilities, especially in the realm of what doesn't get captured by tick or any other data and. You've got two charts that we start off right in the front here on this article. Are you referring to the first one, which includes not only foreign official institutions, foreign banks, and other foreign and IROs, or are you now moved on to just the FOI? Well, the, two, the first chart that includes all of them is important because it shows that you know it's not just foreign official institutions that are engaged in these collateralized repurchase agreements. But specifically, the second chart, which I think if anybody has ever seen a chart of the foreign repo pool, which is just specifically Federal Reserve Bank of New York's uh, custodial accommodations, it matches that one pretty closely because that's really what Tick is picking up. Tick is picking up part of what is a maybe a possibly, you know, the beginning, the beginning step of a, a much wider collateral chain where foreign official institutions are essentially borrowing collateral from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and posting their own cash as their collateral in this reverse repo. Now that in and of itself, you know, maybe that the explanation that's given is, oh, maybe the Fed's, the Fed, it really is paying a higher repo rate. And that's why the foreign institutions are, are more interested in doing this. But when you look at it from the perspective of borrowing treasuries, it's not necessarily that. And then we start thinking, okay, this foreign repo pool balance goes up, which means more foreign official institutions borrowing more treasuries during these same specific periods when we see all of these other things happening. So it doesn't sound like it would be a higher repo rate that is enticing foreign institutions to get a better return on their cash. It sounds more like we should look at this from the perspective of a resale or a reverse repo, which is... They want to borrow more available treasuries during these periods when the rest of the euro dollar system is, is, is throwing off all of these signals of dollar shortage, collateral shortage, and all the things that go along with it. So the mainstream explanation, if you're just interested in, hey, just give me the answer, well, the mainstream media can give you an answer. But if you actually start thinking through these implications and going through the process of, of figuring out what are people doing, what must they be doing? with all of these various complicated uh, transactions, then you start to realize this mainstream idea that you know foreign institutions are seeking out a better repo rate. Oh, by the way, we don't know what the Fed pays on the re foreign repo pool. They don't publish it. So that's even speculation too. So if, you, you know, if you're actually going through and thinking through all of these processes, you start to realize that that can't be the real reason. Why would, why would the Fed pay a higher repo rate during dollar shortage periods? What if it's something else entirely? What if it has to do instead with borrowing collateral that seems to be in short supply during these very same periods? And so working through that in your head helps you understand what must really be going on, especially as we're doing here, if we can tie this into other things, other data and other market indications. And that's what we're looking at. What you were just discussing and teaching us, that's, that, that chart does not appear in this article. Am I right, Jeff? I'm trying to keep up. That's in the... Right. I mean, I debated about whether I should include the foreign repo pool and I left it Definitely. out because I didn't want to, I didn't want to, um, I wanted people to think this through. And that's one of the things that I thought about this morning. I'm like, well, maybe I should have added that in there for a little bit more clarity. So I I'm glad we're so. getting to go through this now is because now we can explain 
you know, we can do a little bit more of detail and a little bit more straightforward explanation, but still having people work through it in their own heads about what must be going on. Because if it's, you know, the Federal Reserve paying a higher repo rate for foreign official institutions, that would be one hell of a coincidence, wouldn't it? Not just a coincidence, it would be four or five coincidences now, you know, that's what we're really talking about. It's when you think about it, if you're just willing to give the, the media, give you an answer from that guy in, in Credit Suisse who says it's a higher repo rate, at least he's speculating it's a higher repo rate. Fine. You won't you won't you won't have any have any way of saying this is what's really happening. But if you actually go through the process and think about what these transactions are in a step by step basis, which you come to the conclusion you left with is that it can't be the repo rate. There has to be something else going on here. And where we started all this was the tick data doesn't give us the other part of it. Because why would foreign official institutions be borrowing treasuries to begin with? Well, if you think back to, say, July of 2016 and the Bank of Japan, what did the Bank of Japan do in July 2016? Well, it did a couple of things. And one of the one of the last things on the list of the, the press release was they, engage, they uh, initiated or I think they expanded what was a treasury swap program which was Japanese banks could go to the Bank of Japan and swap JGBs for U.S. treasuries. That doesn't get picked up on tick, as I started out saying, because that's a security for security transaction, and it's Bank of Japan with a Japanese bank. So th using that as an example, we can then think about what must be on the other side of these treasury, bar you know, these foreign official institutions borrowing treasuries in bunches during dollar shortages, maybe on the, the next step that is completely invisible, that's completely shadows, is completely hidden, doesn't show up on tick, is that these foreign official institutions are then relending these treasuries in a security for security transaction to other counterparties in their own jurisdictions or maybe outside their jurisdictions, we don't know who maybe are running into their own collateral problems. So we put all these things together and what we have is during dollar shortage periods, which we know co correspond very closely to collateral shortage periods, we see an elevated use at the Federal Reserve's foreign repo pool, which doesn't seem to be tied to a higher repo rate. Instead, thinking about it along the lines of these foreign institutions borrowing treasuries, when foreign institutions don't need to borrow treasuries for their own purposes, we can then understand that there's probably other steps involved that are hidden that aren't that big of an intuitive leap when you go through the work and dig out all these transactions. All of that is between the lines, Jeff. We haven't even gotten to the article yet. <laughs> the whole none of that is in the article. There's no graph. None of everything. This is, you yeah, just this said. is what I wanted to explain outside the article because I left. I, I think I left a little bit too much you out should, of it. <laughs> it's a whole article. It's a whole show. And that article itself was, you know, I think 1500. I mean, it was already it was already pretty lengthy. So, yeah, 12 pages. So, yeah. Printer, the, so the message is, look, it's a really good thing to try to work through all of these transactions. It's a really good idea to think through why must this person or this entity be doing that and what's going on? What other possibilities are, are could be could explain what's happening? Very, very informative, very educational, Jeff. Any I mean, you also talked about what's happening in Japan that the, uh, let's see here, and the Caribbean, that um, U.S. banks are not lending to Japan and the Caribbean euro dollar redistribution centers as much as they did in 2020, November and December. Uh, we see a steep drop suggesting deflationary potential. You also raised the U.S. dollar in here and China and how the U.S. dollar is rising and in any number of different ways we can measure it. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're tying yes, this back ahead. to all sorts of data and market prices that all give off the same signal, right? It's all, hey, can we find corroboration for this deflationary, the shortfall, dollar shortage, collateral shortage story that we're starting to see in the, you know, in the foreign repo pool, for example? What does that tell us? Well, if we think about it in terms of shortage of treasuries, that makes sense. And we look at the rest of the tick data, as you just mentioned. You know, U.S. bank claims on Japan and, and the Caribbean, which means fewer dollars being redistributed between those two very important redistribution nodes. That is very much consistent with dollar shortage, dollar tightness. And oh, by the way, it ties in to the month. We're talking about December 2020, all of this year, growing, not shrinking, you know, growing problems, not uh, not growing dollar balances. And then there's, you know, all these other indications, including tick data, you know, China. 
China holding Chinese and Belgian holdings of U.S. Treasuries, which is a surefire signal that they're having dollar problems too. Those holdings have been declining since January. Not only that, CNY, the, the Chinese yuan's exchange rate, since January, it's changed. It's no longer rising in value, which would be consistent with reflation. It's at least sideways, which is something different entirely. The dollar's exchange value in broad fashion, it's been going up since January. Uh, U.S. Treasuries and global bond yields since mid-March, they've flattened out. In fact, you know, some of the global bond yields flat started to uh, flatten out and drop in February. So it's one thing after another, after another, after another, after another. It's consistent, it's coherent, and it's corroborated. It can't be, going back to our original piece here, it can't be that the Federal Reserve is paying a higher repo rate than the market is, and that's enticing foreign official institutions to engage in a reverse repo with the Fed. Instead, it's got to be something up because this happens over and over and over again, where if we look at the same transaction from the perspective of foreign official institutions borrowing treasuries, collateralizing that, bar that borrowing with cash, and then doing something else with those treasuries in their local jurisdiction, dollar-wise, uh, in dollar terms as well, all of it put together, you get this consistent story of a global dollar shortage, deflationary potential, not just you know September. But over the last, you know, over this entire year and including some of last year, too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've done some hundred plus episodes. And this is the very first one where we didn't touch on anything in the article, anything in my notes. I enjoyed it as much. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. Jeff, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about China in part two of this episode. We're going to read the tea leaves regarding their sixth plenum. I'm going to ask you what a plenum is. And we're going to look at some of their recent economic activity and data. <laughs>